every kid in Canada and every kid in the USA dreams of playing in the big leagues. On December 5th, 1990, Steve McKeegan achieved that dream. Coming in and back! Two standing in, coming in, so that two straight shot, shot, save made by McKeegan. And a sparkling glove hand save made by McKeegan, save made by McKeegan. And a big save made by McKeegan. The side of the net, save! To the side of the net, kick, save! Stapleton, a shot, save made! Stands eight, love you, for four! Save! Rebound backhand, save made! See McKeegan! You just can't get it by the kitchen. McKeegan has just made the save of the game. Steve had those same dreams. Dreams without action are just dreams, and from a young age, he took this to heart. From his formative stages playing minor hockey in Strathroy, Ontario, until his first appearance in the NHL with the Vancouver Canucks, he never relied on dreams, but rather action. Hours were spent sprinting up hills at the local high school. Thousands of pucks were fired in his backyard. Hundreds of miles were covered in jogging shoes. Tons of weight were lifted, and hours were spent banging and catching tennis balls off the wall. His dream wasn't left to chance. He had a burning desire to get one day better every day. An all-star season in Junior B in Strathroy propelled him to a full scholarship at Miami University, where he shattered virtually all goaltending records by the time he was a junior. After posting an all-league season as a sophomore, he was drafted in the second round of the college draft to the Vancouver Canucks. His NHL career came to a halt prematurely on a vicious check from behind after the play was whistled dead. Over a decade has passed since then, and Steve McKeegan has used that time to develop many innovative training techniques, like the use of mini pucks, clear pucks, and peekaboo screen boards. Many of the students he has worked with have gone on to junior and college hockey careers. Steve has had the privilege to coach NHLers like Johan Hedberg, Yanni Hermy and Rich Perron. He's used the same drive he had to make the NHL to make thousands of young goalies future pros. The most important fundamental that a goaltender must have is the basic stance. Every goaltender develops their own stance through experience, modeling successful goalies, and by learning from goaltending coaches. All saves and movements start from the basic stance, and depending on the situation, the stance may take on different forms. When viewed from the side, a straight line should be formed from the shoulders to the knees to the balls of the feet. The stick should be firmly held with the blade flat and centered on the ice, about a foot in front of the skates to help cushion rebounds and to cut down the angle. Blake skates are shoulder width apart, with the weight slightly on the balls of the feet. The skates should be tilted slightly inward so the weight is distributed on the inside edges a little more than the outside edge. Again we see a solid, balanced basic stance with a good knee bend and stick gap. Scott plays an open stance, and although he does have openings in the arms and a generous five-hole, he appears to cover a lot of shooting space. Another strong feature of a quality stance is the upper body angle. The upper body should be just slightly forward of vertical to maximize net coverage. A glove open and held like Scott's actually discourages a shot there, because in the shooter's view there is limited net available, which will probably result in an attempt at another target. Moving the stick forward in the stance brings the gloves out on a plane in front of the body and creates a solid front-to-back balanced position. When we see Blake's stance compared to Scott's, there are clear differences. Blake's is quite compact, while Scott's stance is visually meant to appear large and discouraging to the shooters. Because of his size, Blake doesn't need to appear larger. By closing holes and using his size, Blake can force most shots wide, high, or right at him. To score here, you would have to make a perfect shot even if he doesn't move. A forward glove position also significantly increases the amount of net covered and allows easy tracking of the puck right into the gloves. Solid glove positioning before a shot is released will also result in many accidental saves where pucks may have arrived through screens or tips. 
The index finger should be extended down the face of the paddle to help prevent the stick from spinning on a hard shot and aid in rebound control. On poor angle shots, the stance should close a little. Blake covers a ton of net, and by using an open stance here, he actually is risking a bad goal through him. By simply using a closed stance on this type of play, he makes it almost impossible for a shot to beat him. Great goalies prevent all shots from going through holes in their stances. This stance may relax a little as the puck moves around the zone in non-dangerous areas, but great goalies assume a proper shot-ready stance before the attack comes. In the cases of a screen, a hard one-timer, or a possible backdoor pass, this stance should actually deepen further. Common Stance Problems Getting caught with a stance that's too erect leaves the low corners vulnerable and makes lateral movements quite weak. A deep crouch will allow for explosive movements and great foot reactions. A goaltender opens up the top shelf if his upper body is angled too far forward. Restricted range of motion in the arms is another drawback to this flaw. Misguided stances where the glove isn't facing the puck and the stick is angled too far back will really hinder a goaltender's progress. Many goalies get caught resting the glove in a closed position. A quick shot can arrive before you have a chance to react. If the puck can't see the pocket of your glove at all times, you will get burned. Parker demonstrates another common error with the glove. As the goaltender moves around the crease, they carry their glove with the palm facing the ceiling. Although the glove is open, it isn't square to the puck. Keeks Keys. Keep your stick flat on the ice, away from your feet. Get that butt down and be in your stance early. Show the palm and pocket of the glove to the puck. Goaltending is about positioning. Knowing where to be and how to get there quickly are two requirements for success. A goaltender actually spends more time moving to get into position than he does in the act of stopping the puck itself. If you stop 30 shots in a game and a save requires less than a second, you've spent less than 30 seconds stopping pucks. Let's take a look at how goaltenders can get to their target position-wise as explosively and as controlled as possible. The best goalies have great skating skills. And those goalies that can get to where they need to be early enough really make the shooter's job difficult. A goaltender with great lateral movement and average reflexes will always be more successful than a goaltender with average lateral movement and great reflexes. What is the best way to get from one side of the net to the other? There are really two basic skills. They are the shuffle and the T-push. These two motions allow you to face the play or stay square while exploding sideways. The shuffle is used to move short distances quickly without opening up a big hole between your legs. The toes should face the puck and your stick should stay flat on the ice. Keep a good crouch, ready at all times. Keep the lead skate as vertical as possible as this spreads your weight across both edges and will prevent you from catching an edge and tripping yourself up. A developing goaltender may get caught with a lazy stick when moving sideways. It is crucial for the stick to maintain solid position between the legs and actually lead the movement slightly. Blake plants his right foot here and as a result ends up on his rear. This planting of the back foot is a typical mistake even advanced goalies sometimes make. The T-push is used to move bigger distances quickly. To execute a proper T-push, you place your feet in the T-shape with the toe of the one skate pointing in the direction you want to go. As with the shuffle, you forcefully explode with the back leg. As soon as you push off, you should quickly bring the back leg in to close the five hole. If you find your push leg slipping out when you attempt to really explode, check to make sure you have good, sharp skates and try starting your push with the push skate as vertical as possible. As you move laterally, maintain good stick discipline by positioning your stick flat on the ice and keeping it centered in your stance. Leading with your stick and gloves involves getting them over slightly before your legs. This helps keep your upper body square and prevents a quick shot from catching you out of position. 
The other basic motion involves moving out away from the net and back in towards the net. Telescoping is the term used to describe the forward motion and retreating is the term used to describe the backward motion. To play angles properly, a goaltender needs to be able to gain depth quickly and also be able to retreat rapidly. The changes in direction from telescoping to retreating to lateral all require great power, control, and precise transition. To telescope out of your net, you make C-shaped cuts with your skates digging in and pushing with the heel portion of your skates. To retreat, you make the identical C-shaped cuts and wiggle your way backwards. The only difference with retreating is that now you dig in and push with the toes of your skates. Stopping can be done in a precise controlled fashion using a one-foot snowplow or a hockey stop. The one-foot snowplow requires one of the skates to remain square to the play while the other skate rotates to the side, digging in abruptly, halting the momentum. Every free moment in practice should be spent working on these movements, changing direction suddenly and stopping precisely where you want. Great skating ability is more important than fast reflexes. Keeks Keys. Keep your upper body frozen in position while your lower body moves you around. Your stick should lead you around by staying flat on the ice at all times. Movement speed is more important than reflexes. One of the most important developments in the evolution of goaltending was the introduction of the butterfly save. Don't be confused. The butterfly is a save, not a style. When used properly, the butterfly save is one of the goaltender's greatest weapons. Blake and CJ show open butterfly save positions that are used on low shots when the goaltender will get a chance to react to the puck. The five hole is kept fairly small, the stick remains flat on the ice, and the gloves are open on a plane in front of the body. From the side we see that Blake keeps his upper body as tall as possible to take away the aerial angle. By staying out near the top of the crease, he helps to prevent goals in the top corners. When faced with a backdoor one-timer, a hard deflection or a tough screen, a goaltender should use a closed butterfly. Shots through your armpits or legs are easily preventable with a good arm press and knee press. No one purposely aims for the armpit holes, so these are purely luck. Keep them closed in these situations. The glove should be pressed tightly on the front edge of the pad, as close to the puck as possible. This simple forward glove adjustment covers several more square feet of net. Scott explosively drives his knees to the ice while fanning his legs out to the side. Since there is no danger of a tip here, Scott uses good stick involvement to precisely control rebounds. There are several common mistakes a young goaltender makes. Parker has dropped his upper body down forming an accordion shape. This significantly reduces coverage of the top corners. With a youngster, inflexibility in the hips and knees will hinder the amount of flare and pad rotation the goaltender achieves. If the pad doesn't sit vertically, a small hole is created by the boot break. The pad may roll better in some cases by loosening the pad straps. Many goals end up in the net after they went through the goalie because of poor stick discipline and the proper closing of all holes. Keeks Keys. Deny access to all pucks through holes. Make the shooter be good, not lucky. Strive to use the butterfly with good depth at or near the top of the crease. Be selective when you leave your feet. Don't be a premature guesser. The most popular variation of the full butterfly save is called the half pad save. It's actually used more than the full butterfly. The majority of half pad saves would be considered reactive as the goaltender must read whether the puck is traveling left or right. The half pad save is executed by dropping into a butterfly position with one pad extended to the side. The support leg is positioned directly under the hip which will give the save leg more range. Notice how the face of Blake's pad is vertical and how both knees are placed flush to the ice. Scott's arms are pressed to the side to create solid closure of any holes through the body. 
If there's a possibility of a deflection, the stick should remain in the five hole. However, if not, the goaltender should use good stick discipline and precision. Pucks can be neatly placed in the corners with slight angling of the stick in front of the pad. Blake has great flair with his half pad saves. Flair simply refers to flexibility and range a goaltender has when using a half pad save. Notice how very few pucks actually make it to the goal pads. The stick plays a great role in controlling rebounds here for Parker. By controlling your blocker hand, you can keep your stick more vertical. If you get the stick angle too far back, you may ramp the puck up into your own net. Keeks Keys Close all holes in the armpits and knees. Where possible, get the stick involved. Keep the save leg as vertical as possible. The paddle down is executed by instantly driving your blocker down as you drop to a half pad butterfly like position. As the blocker is driven to the ice, the paddle is positioned firmly on the ice with no holes under it. The glove side leg pad doesn't have to be flush to the ice, but it shouldn't leave a hole over the paddle. A closed paddle down can be moved into an extension paddle down if more range is needed on rebounds, in scrambles, or other tight loose puck situations. In this position, the lower part of the net is covered, and because the arms are tightly stacked to the side, there are no holes for the puck to get through. Notice how Blake's blocker is beside, not in front of, his right knee. With the exception of wraparounds, the paddle down must be done at the top of the crease. Blake completely seals the upper and lower net in this situation. This save works on Deke's tight little tips, scrambles in front and wraparounds. Avoid using it on long shots, point shots, and poor angle attempts. Blake delivers a tight seal on the post and prepares to snap back to his feet if the puck jumps out in front. On this side, we see the shooter with his arms well in front reaching for the wrap. This most certainly results in a low shot. Many young goaltenders learning this save get scored on underneath the paddle before it is jammed down. Avoid collapsing your upper body in an accordion fashion so you don't open up the top shelf. Since this is a blocking save, it is important to make your wall as big as possible, so keep the trapper properly stacked on the front part of your pad. Keeks Keys Only use the paddle down on plays in tight or on wraparounds. You must drive the paddle down hard to seal up the five hole. Close all holes in your wall. The two-pad slide is considered a blocking save because it is used to defend against goal-scoring opportunities where the goaltender must fill a great deal of space quickly. It does fill a lot of space quickly, but it may leave you out of position for second chances. The pads stack on top of each other, as does the top arm, making a tight wall as high as possible. Parker demonstrates a variation of the two-pad save, where the upper body forms an L shape, which helps the goalie see the puck into their pads. When you recover from the two-pad slide, it is important to maintain great focus on the puck's location and keep your body facing out towards the play. Strength is crucial to make this recovery happen quickly and smoothly. Notice how Scott uses the inside arm to power his recovery. His blocking surfaces stay square to the play and he regains his feet quickly. Footwork is the engine that drives this save. You must open your hip by pivoting and then fire an explosive T-push to transport you to your target position for this save. As you are moving, the bottom leg snaps through underneath, staying flush to the ice at all times. You must end up in a nice vertical wall without any holes. Blake has a great pad stack and lower arm position, but he could do a better job of showing the face of the paddle to help cover as much space as possible. From ice level, we see another crucial element for the success of this save. To minimize the area above the two-pad slide, you must attempt to make this save at the top of the blue crease. We can see that the aerial angle is better handled as the goaltender gains depth. The two-pad slide requires power, strength, and control. CJ begins with solid technique and then drops off a little as fatigue and time become a factor. 
Parker has good lateral drive with his two-pad saves and demonstrates some decent recovery skills. Young goalies tend to make some common basic errors when learning to use the two-pad slide. Balancing yourself on the hip with a good vertical pad stack is a tough skill and many goalies end up on their belly. Ending up on your butt or back instead of the hip is another common flaw. This position opens up many holes in your wall and doesn't add much height, so many pucks will make it over you and in the net or through you. You don't want to throw this save back to the post if possible. The upper net is exposed and most decent players can easily roof it there. If the player is out too far from the net, the two pad slide may be a poor choice because this also results in upper net openings. Whether you are standing or down, you need to strive to be square. Blake squares up to center ice instead of the man, and he can easily deke around your wall if he has good hands. Keeks Keys. Seal up all holes in your wall. Keep the wall as high and as vertical as possible. Throw this save at the top of the crease, not back to the post. Great goalies make recoveries look easy, fluid, and instantaneous. After years of repetitive executions, Scott is back to his feet from a butterfly in a fraction of a second. The first simple recovery to learn is the one leg recovery from the butterfly position. Scott snaps one knee up, bringing the skate under his knee, and with power, pulls the other leg up into position. Youngsters will naturally favor one leg when performing this recovery, but both legs need to be developed equally. From the side, you really notice how controlled and quiet Scott's upper body is. His stick and gloves remain in a good, solid position. Awareness of the puck's location is crucial, so when you recover, you must be square to the puck, as Blake does here. You should also notice that as he recovers, he continues to track the puck carrier, which will allow him to aim his recovery towards the puck carrier. Blake recovers directly to his stance without getting too erect on his feet, as time is an important factor. Besides a simple knee recovery, we need to learn how to recover from your belly and your butt. CJ pushes explosively from the belly position up to his knees and then executes a typical knee recovery. Young goalies tend to have more awkward and slower recoveries because they have yet to develop sufficient upper body strength. Instead of flopping over to his belly, CJ stays square to the play, places his glove hand by his hip and drives up to his feet. Parker's experience, strength and age make his butt recovery a little more polished and powerful. Placing his glove by his hip, he drives up to his feet. The most common error beginning goaltenders make is the tendency to roll to their belly, which turns their back to the play. The goaltender needs to spend substantial time on these recoveries, especially from their butt. Throwing on the gear at home and firing off dozens of these recoveries is a great way to become as agile as the pros. In addition to repetitively practicing your recoveries, you need to address the strength issue. To recover explosively, you need to be strong, so upper body strength development plays a crucial role here for goalies of any age. One drill Steve has come up with to work on a goaltender's recovery skills is the tennis ball recovery drill. Using a racquetball racket and a tennis ball, the goaltender attempts all the recoveries while keeping the ball alive, bouncing on the racket. Besides the actual recovery work, this drill requires the goaltender to maintain concentration, balance, control, and fluid motion. Blake uses knee drops, belly drops, sliding butterflies, and butt drops. Great recoveries allow the goaltender to make saves others can't and forces shooters to make great shots because the goaltender has re-established solid positioning. Blake demonstrates the ability to stay square, to control most rebounds, to stay compact, and to stay low. Although it's considered an advanced skill, beginning goalies should also begin to learn to recover with the appropriate foot. Blake always gets up with the leg opposite the direction he will need to push. This allows him to start his explosive lateral push faster. Keeks Keys. The secret to recoveries is repetition more than technique. Always get up first with the leg opposite the direction you need to go. Maintain puck focus throughout the complete recovery.
Hugging the post is a basic skill goaltenders need to master as soon as they begin to play goal. Every year, dozens of goals are given up because of poor technique when the goaltender is hugging the post. Even goaltenders in the NHL get caught napping and let in a goal from behind the goal line. If the goaltender hugs the post properly, a goal can never be scored. Blake's chest faces to center. His stick is placed to cut down passes. His skate is jammed to the post and he takes quick looks to the slot for dangerous players. CJ seals up the glove side post, but like many young goalies, leans a little too much weight on the post. By spreading the legs a little to support your stance, you'll be able to drive to the top of the crease more easily. Parker has the side of his skate tightly jammed to the post, sealing off any openings. His stick is set to break up passes and his glove is used to anchor him to the post. Scott demonstrates his stick range from the paddle and how the glove can be used to snag aerial pucks heading for danger in the slot. He also takes quick looks off the puck to find potential dangerous players in front. On the blocker side, CJ really seals up the post and puts his stick in a decent position to break up any passes. Parker's stick is square to the puck, even when behind the goal line, and his glove is prepared to grab any saucer passes that may come within range. His body faces towards center, so he doesn't give the man in the corner anything to bank the puck in off. A key area to look at is the hole created at the knee bend. There can't be any daylight here, as many smart players will try to luck out and throw one through any opening, if you don't achieve a good seal on the post. Keeks Keys. Keep your chest facing center ice, because that is where the shot will eventually come from. Seal up the post with your skate and post side leg. Take quick looks to the slot to find dangerous players. As Steve demonstrates, a centering pass is an extremely dangerous situation and the goaltender must attempt to protect their limits. If the pass does make it through your limits uncontested, it will be an easy tap-in goal for the man in front. A hard pass should be ramped up in the air by tilting your stick backwards. By at least getting the puck up into the air, you'll make a tap-in goal next to impossible. If the pass is controllable, cushion it and smother it where possible. If the puck is passed in the air, try to get a glove on it. Scott is solid, deflecting hard passes, reads which passes can be cushioned and smothered, and adept at catching aerial passes backhanded. Remember to take quick looks to the slot before the pass occurs to help you pre-gauge where the pass will go. Blake has good range, breaking up tight passes, and if a player decides to walk it in tight, he can slide a poke check to cut him down. Blake gets a good jump on this centering pass and achieves good depth at the top of the crease. Notice the quick looks Parker takes to intelligently anticipate where he'll need to get to when the pass does happen. He attacks out to the player's stick, not the body, which really fills up the angle properly. By closing holes and getting a good jump, Parker makes this difficult save look routine. Many goalies hold their stick incorrectly when trying to cut down a pass. By leaving a hole between your skate and the heel of your stick, you've given the player three passing options. Now he can put it in this hole, over your stick with a saucer pass, or pass in front of your stick blade. Pulling the stick back can encourage an easily broken up flat ice pass. At the very least, take away the pigeon hole under your stick to make your decision easier. Parker almost scores on himself here because he contacted the puck too far in front of his body. Break the pass up as close to the post side skate as possible. Keeks Keys. Protect your limits from tight passes at all costs. Ramp hard passes and control slower passes. Use your trapper on aerial passes. The stick is a great weapon to deflect, stop, control, and direct an incoming puck. Blake uses a cushioning motion here to make a puck die at his feet to be easily smothered. By giving with the puck, the puck can be controlled instead of pushing the puck back out into danger, as many young goalies tend to do. Notice when he does cover up the puck, he keeps his head up to protect himself from any accidental contact from an aggressive opponent. 
The stick can also be used to cushion side net dumps, which will allow the goaltender to leave the puck in a good spot for his defense to pick up. Without solid cushioning skills, this puck may bound into the corner, creating a tough situation for Parker's defenseman. Solid use of the stick when stopping low shots is called stick discipline. Without good stick discipline, many unnecessary dangerous rebounds will be generated. On low shots, it's important for the goaltender to back up stick saves with half pad or butterfly saves. This will be more reliable over time than simply using your stick from your stance on your feet. Cliffy quickly moves his stick in an arc to the side in front of his pads. He lets the speed of the puck do the work and is quite accurate in placing these pucks in the target net. A hard shot to a low corner should be angled out of danger, into the corner or up into the stands. Use the speed and force of the shot to control it. You don't need to jab or stab at the puck. Instead, use small, precise motions. By sending the puck to the corner with elevation, you make any opponent take longer to control or corral the puck. Tilting the stick blade back like a 9-iron will accomplish this goal. Blake is controlled, precise, and he doesn't need to use any flashy stick motions. When there is no danger of a tip or deflection, you must strive to have good stick involvement on these low shots. Rebounds off the pads here will end up right back out in front in danger. Keeks Keys. Strive to have more pucks hitting your stick than your pads. Use the puck speed to do the work. Angle the stick blade so the puck is elevated into the corner. The glove save, above all others, is clearly the flashiest crowd-pleasing save. Every young goaltender dreams of making the save of the game with a cobra-like snatch in the dying seconds. Goals over time fade from memories, but every goalie can remember a great glove save. Glove saves are the product of proper shot preparation. The glove must be available, wide open, with the palm facing at the puck held on a plane in front of the body. Surprisingly, many goalies are beat here before the shot is released because of poor pre-shot positioning. The puck must be caught in the pocket. The eye should follow the puck into the glove, and the glove must give a little to cushion the puck. The glove should be used to control any shot near the body, as well as shots to the top corner. Scott has a great glove hand, and takes great pride in making sure every puck near his glove is snagged. A great rule of thumb to live by is the same one NFL receivers use. If the ball touches their hands anywhere, it must be caught. Likewise, if that puck hits your glove anywhere, it must be held. Saves like Blake makes are impossible if your glove is too big to control and not broken in well enough. A goaltender should spend hours daily breaking in their glove. It won't happen sitting in your bag. Keeks Keys. The glove has to be properly positioned early. If it hits your glove, catch it. Follow the puck into the pocket with your eyes. The blocker save commonly takes a back seat to the flashy glove save, but it is just as important in terms of rebound control. In this blocker targeting drill, Parker keeps his blocker on a plane in front of his body and uses the speed of the puck to angle shots towards the corner. He uses precise movements without punching at the puck. Blake makes great eye contact with his blocker, slightly rotates his wrist, and precisely deposits the puck harmlessly into the corner. One of the most difficult saves a goaltender must make is on a shot to the blocker side that is above the leg pad but below the blocker. Using the paddle of the stick can be risky, but the best goaltenders have the ability to go down with their blocker to pick off this dangerous attempt. Blake makes these saves look routine, and we can see he closes up his holes in the process. Keeks Keys. Let the speed of the puck do the work. Watch the puck into your blocker. Be prepared to get your blocker on shots just above your pad. Every goaltender from beginner to NHLer at some level struggles with rebound control. It is one area of the game that can truly never be perfected, but must always be a focal point during any practice session. 
Every shot in practice needs to be addressed with rebound control in mind. Good practice habits and a bitterness towards dangerous rebounds in practice will really help you improve in this area. The precise use of your two best rebound control weapons, your stick and trapper, will be crucial. When a goaltender is viewed from the front, an invisible L shape is created. The L is useful to visualize as it gives us a guide on how a given shot should be handled. A shot within the L should be caught or controlled with puck possession maintained with the goalie. We can see a shot at the knees should be caught, as it would be within the L. A shot below or outside the L should be directed to the closest corner. We can see the L is still visible when the goalie butterflies, but the same guidelines apply. Within the L, get possession. Outside the L, direct the puck to the appropriate corner. Statistically, more shots hit the middle third of the net, so in effect there are many pucks that end up directed right at the goalie. These shots are referred to as midline shots, as they're basically fired right at the middle of the goalie. It is wise to spend time handling these types of shots and learning how to put the puck in the proper places out of danger and to develop second effort battling skills. By using an active glove or a gut trap, Scott takes these hard midline shots and accepts them into his body. Shots headed for the knees are brought into the concave gut area to be absorbed and held. Pros work diligently on these types of rebound control prevention drills. When we pull in closer, you can see how Scott's body concaves and softens itself to help deaden the puck. Once the puck strikes the area, the gloves are quickly brought in to seal up the rebound. The use of the glove cradle is another technique to handle a hard high shot off the upper chest. Blake closes up the armpit, accepts the puck high, quickly snapping the glove in tightly underneath the puck as it drops from the shoulder. Cliffy pulls pucks off his hip and on in tight shots by using an accurate active glove. The other basic element of rebound control involved the handling of shots outside the L. As we saw in the half pad and butterfly segments, stick involvement on low shots is the key. Scott ramps up low hard drives to the corners with excellent direction and elevation. Another area to address is what happens when the first touch of the puck didn't involve a proper rebound control. Great rebound goalies battle for loose puck rebounds by knowing where to stay down filling space and when to get up. The second efforts made here during this controlled chaos are what win close games. The depth of the rebound and how close an opponent is to the rebound will dictate whether you get up or not. Here Parker realizes he's left a dangerous rebound three to five feet out in front. With an attacker on the puck, he chooses to stay down while repositioning himself. This strategy didn't open up any holes and allowed a big save to be made. When the puck jumps out over five feet and there is no immediate threat, you must try to regain your deep stance as soon as possible. The rebound game is probably the best drill used to work on rebound control on the first touch and on battling skills if a loose puck rebound was given up. A shooter in the slot fires hard midline shots of the goalie. The shooter can have one or two partners stationed on either side of the net eagerly awaiting a loose puck. Any goals on shots or rebounds give the shooters a point, and likewise any puck possession a goalie gets before a goal will give him a point. If a goalie can direct the puck behind the goal line or make it hit the sideboards, he would also win a point. First one to five points wins. Keeks Keys. Where possible, treat every rebound in practice as if it was a game. Accept the puck and gain possession wherever possible. If you can't get possession, get the puck into the corners. In many cases, the skill of a goaltender in handling loose pucks will keep more pucks out of the net than simply having good first stop skills. Blake shows us the proper way to get a whistle on a loose puck, directed easily to the net. Once the puck is cushioned and covered, the glove should slide back to the front of the knee to back up the smother. Keep your head up so you can see if an on-rushing forward is about to crash into you. Keeping the stick up as a barrier will also help protect you from skates, knees, and sticks. When you put your head down on top of your gloves, you make yourself very vulnerable because you can't see a collision coming. Your head and neck are now down near sharp skate blades, sticks, and other dangers. If they do snow you, ignore them and resist the urge to use your stick on them. Display emotional control. When a puck is just outside your smothering range, the ability to pull and smother cleanly is required. 
When you pull the puck back, pull it to the side and easily enough so that you don't end up popping it back into your own net. With a partner, you can practice this skill and add a little competition to it to create some realism. Have a coach call out a trigger word and then see who can pull and smother the quickest. You'll be surprised how often you can use this in a game situation. Steve played against Dominic Hasek many times and saw him cover the puck frequently with his blocker glove after dropping the stick. This technique does have some benefits and some dangers. If the puck is just off to your blocker side, the blocker is closer and much easier to use to cover the puck than your trapper. However, any time you are purposely dropping your stick, make sure you are 100% successful covering the puck. Working with a partner on your blocker covers in practice is a great way to develop confidence and skill in this area. Since many of the loose pucks you see in a game arise when you are down, it's important to add recoveries into your training when you're working on covering up. Many times loose pucks are lost in traffic and plop down in dangerous spots. It's also a good idea to practice your covering up hunger by forcing yourself to quickly locate a loose puck and then cover it. Keeks Keys. The tidy coverage of loose pucks will keep dozens of pucks out of your net every year, so dedicate practice time to this area. Learn to use your stick to help pull pucks in. If the puck is closer to your blocker, don't be afraid to grab the puck with your blocker hand. The first key to stopping a breakaway for a young goaltender is to understand the shooter's options and have a simple strategy in place. The best goaltenders in the world use the Y theory to play the breakaway. And we can see the pucks we set out form the letter Y. The shooter can, and often does, shoot on a breakaway. It's our job to prevent a shot if at all possible. The reasoning behind this is simple. If you give a shooter too many options on a breakaway, they will make the goalie look foolish. When shooting, the goalie presents five basic targets, the top and bottom corners and the five holes. If they deke, there really are only two options after all the faking, left or right. When we know a deke is the only probable option, our job becomes easier. Two decisions are preferable to five decisions. Blake shows us the Y pattern by challenging out, hesitating and then quickly retreating. Once he gets to the top of the crease, he will explode whichever way the opponent dekes. Once you realize a breakaway is in progress, you must challenge out along the stem of the Y. When you challenge out like this, a shot would be risky because you've taken away most of the available net. The timing of the backward movement is difficult to master, but there are some cues to use. When they get within about 10 feet, you begin backing up maintaining a fairly tight stance. Parker reads the deke well and slams the door on the blocker side deke. On the glove side deke, Blake shows great patience on the fake and seals up the deke with a powerful diagonal push. Notice that Blake made his move before getting back into the blue crease, as this would have opened up too much net. Better shooters will try to adjust the puck to open up shooting space. Here, the shooter pulls the puck to the backhand, opens up the net, and lets a dangerous shot go. Blake responds well, anticipating the adjustment and explodes out with a nice blocker save. Youngsters playing breakaways often make a fundamental error by backing up into the crease, which opens up way too much shooting space. In practice, young goalies should practice following the Y pattern to develop comfort with it and to learn to explode in the correct direction at the correct time. Parker shows a textbook perfect execution of this Y pattern. He uses proper hesitation, great stick discipline, and he slides across the top of the crease instead of back to the post. This really jams the shooter taking away the top shelf. Remaining stationary with your skates planted in the ice causes almost certain failure. The goaltender is susceptible to fakes, good shots, and is easily beaten on deeks because the goaltender has no flow. Retreating back into the crease again causes many problems, and young goalies must strive to make their move at the top of the blue crease. Going for the first move is probably the most common complaint we hear from coaches. Patience is developed over time through trial and error, as well as position confidence. If you have a good challenge on the initial angle, anything that looks like a shot is probably a fake. 
Biting on a fake many times also opens up holes as the goaltender struggles to stay with the play. Patience, good stick discipline, and a hard knee drive are required to keep these holes from opening up. Here, Blake bites on a fake and then is in trouble swimming when the actual shot is released. Remember that some aspects of the position are only developed through years of studying the hows and whys of goals against you. Blake won't fall for that same move again. Keeks Keys. Force the deke with a good initial challenge. Show patience and resist the fakes. Close up holes when you drive to your butterfly or half pad save. Players behind the net are extremely dangerous, and more than ever, power plays and offense attacks are generated from behind the goal line. Parker demonstrates how quickly he can drive post to post, which is the foundation upon which behind the net situations are handled. Goal scorers will often try to cut the puck back after a goalie leaves the post, so Parker spends time practicing looking through the net over his shoulder. In doing so, he will be tough to catch on that type of play. Scott can get a great explosive push post to post and actually forms a nice seal on the post when he arrives. Remaining in control until the player makes a commitment is required. Scott also practices head switches and looking through the net to keep an eye on the attacker. Blake demonstrates how we lead the shooter as he attempts to go from one side to the other. In this manner, a quick cutback will easily be recognized and stopped. Notice that Blake's chest and pads stay square to center ice. Technically, the man behind the net shouldn't score, but a centering pass out front would ultimately find the danger man in front. Keeping your chest facing the potential goal score is solid technical thinking. If you do get caught in a head switch anticipating a wraparound too early, you'll get burned. You must continue to look through the net, over your close shoulder at the man until he fully commits to the other side, or you'll be lining up for another center ice faceoff. In the event of a quick pass to a teammate behind the net, you must drive explosively to the post, sealing up the close side and any holes under you. The close paddle down works well here. Keeks Keys. Look through the net, over your shoulder, closest to the puck carrier. Keep your chest and pads facing up ice. Driving post to post with a proper seal is required. Playing the angles is the phrase used to describe what a goaltender can do to lessen the net available to shoot at. We know that a goal net is four feet high by six feet wide, so there are 24 square feet of net to protect. Blake demonstrates a simple technique goalies use to help place themselves in good position. By tapping the post lightly with his stick, shaft, and his trapper, Blake knows where he is in relation to the net without looking. Scott uses this technique as well to play a rush from the other team. Technically, this is called playing the angle inside out. The goaltender starts inside the crease, taps off, and challenges out on the appropriate angle. This technique is used by 99% of pro and elite goalies. The opposite and incorrect way to play the angles on the line rush is called outside in. The goaltender starts somewhere out in the slot and then backs in as the rush approaches. Inconsistent ice markings, different size rinks, and many other factors make this approach risky. When an average size goaltender places themselves back on the goal line, there is a ton of room open up on both sides of the net. In CJ's case here, there is probably more net open than he is actually covering. By telescoping out to the top of the crease, a significant amount of net is taken away from the shooter. This is an important principle for a goaltender to learn when they're playing the angles. Challenge out from the goal line to the top of the crease or higher, depending on the situation. Another principle we must understand is being square to the puck at all times. By definition, this simply means your belly button should always be aimed at the puck when it's in front of the goal line. Here, CJ squares up to the body, not the puck, and we see how much net is left open. The square line is an imaginary line that extends from the middle of the goal line directly to the puck. 
You must be centered on this line at all times, with equal space available for the shooter on both sides. As the play moves around the zone, the square line swings rapidly, and you must strive to straddle this line at all times. If you extend lines from the puck to both posts, you have now created a shooting triangle. Any puck shot between these two lines will go in, unless they hit the goalie. When we compare Blake and CJ, we can see how much more distance CJ will have to travel to make a save than Blake. Because of his size, Blake can play a more conservative game, while CJ really needs to challenge to fill up space. From a side angle, we see the shooting triangle is much smaller, and Scott can easily fill up the net. In fact, by closing his stance a little, he can actually place more of his gear into an effective position. Smart goalies close up their stance as the puck moves to poor angle positions. From a really poor angle, we can see how truly small the shooting triangle becomes. At this stage, the goalie's job should be pretty easy, but we still see goals being scored from here quite often. Sometimes the goalie doesn't stay square and pulls back into a post-hug position too early. An open stance is also responsible for many stoppable goals through the goalie. Close up, get to the top of the crease, and straddle the square line. Even a smaller goalie like CJ has little room open. Blake's size makes a goal here highly unlikely, even if he doesn't move. By closing his stance and simply standing there, he's closed off all the daylight. From our overhead angle, we can see the shooting triangle and square line from a different perspective. With this depth, Blake would only need to make a small save movement either way to completely fill the open space. In fact, a closed butterfly would practically seal off the complete angle. Good shooters try to open up net by adjusting the puck. The drag snapper is a common technique the good goal scorers use. By pulling the puck into their feet, before release, we can see how much net is actually opened up. Awareness of hand and body position helps the goaltender intelligently anticipate this attack, and Blake drives a sliding half-pad save to seal up the lower part of the net. A push shot is used to attack in the other direction, and by concentrating on the stick-puck relationship, Blake can sense this attempt in advance. Again, he responds with a hard knee drive, pushing a half-pad save down to the side to jam up the attempt. The aerial angle is an important concept for the goaltender to understand, because you can always cover more top shelf when you leave your feet, if you do so, at the top of the crease or higher. The puck forms a triangle with the crossbar and the ice level portion of the post. By challenging out and making all save selections at the top of the crease, we keep the available aerial angle quite small. Keeks Keys. Always face your belly button at the puck when it is in front of the goal line. Make all your saves at the top of the crease if possible. Strive to straddle the square line at all times, giving the shooter equal space on both sides. I was one of those kids growing up that fell in love with the gear the goalies were wearing. To a youngster, these were the brave men in full armor off to battle. If I had to come up with a reason why I started playing goal, it was because of the cool equipment. Goaltenders have unique equipment, and many myths abound concerning sizing, selection, and purchasing. How can a parent or goaltender today make smart choices when it comes to sizing, pricing, and the quality of protection? Protection is where this discussion starts and stops. A goaltender that develops a fear of the puck is almost impossible to cure. Usually, improperly sized equipment and poor protection are the causes of this problem. Most pro goaltenders wear cotton pajama-like t-shirts and pants underneath their equipment. Hockey socks really help to keep internal knee pads in place and present a professional look. The best way to keep the hockey socks in place is to use a garter belt to securely hold them. From a confidence point of view, the most important piece of equipment a goaltender wears is the jock. The goaltender's jock is larger and more thickly padded than a forward's jock because of the obvious trauma it's designed to prevent. Many pro goaltenders wear a forward's jock with a goaltender's jock worn over it for maximum protection. The pants are worn a lot larger than players' pants to fill more net. The thigh pads in goal pants are thicker and wider and the inner thigh also has additional protection. It is strongly recommended that all goaltenders wear an inner knee pad. This inner knee pad is important when executing a closed butterfly or a half pad save. 
Goaltenders use special skates that have additional protective shells which surround the foot and use a thicker, less rockered blade than a skate a forward or a defenseman would use. Young goalies should learn to tie their own skates as soon as possible. By pulling tightly and then forcing the toe downward, even younger goalies can get their skates pretty tight. Today, goaltenders can choose which way they prefer to tie their pads to their skates, leather toe straps or toe laces. The toe strap or lace is designed to keep your pad from spinning on your leg. It is a good idea to wrap some tape around your front skate post so that your strap or lace doesn't break every time you stop a shot there. The lace is attached by wrapping it around the front post and then threading it back through the various openings in the skate blade holder. Where it travels is up to the individual, but it should be completed by coming up on the top of the foot to be tied like the laces in the skate itself. The heel strap is the other strap that holds your pad directly to the skate. This strap should be slid through the last space in your skate blade holder. The calf straps should be worn snug enough to keep the pad in place the upper straps are normally worn quite loose to allow the pad to sit vertically on the ice when butterflying. Young goaltenders should wear an internal collar style neck guard as well as the clear plastic dangler. If a goaltender today is flinching on hard shots, the first place to look is at their chest and arm pads. If there is a place to splurge when it comes to gear, this is the area. You want the sleeves to come within one to two inches of the wrist and the belly pad to just touch the top of your goalie jock. Check to see that the elbows and shoulders are covered in plastic with foam underneath. Look for protection on the inner portions of the arms and thick protection around the collarbone. Suspenders or belts are used to hold the pants in position, with the chest pad either tucked in or over the pants depending on individual preference. It's up to the individual to decide whether they are more comfortable with the chest and arm tucked into the pads with the suspenders over top or by wearing them over your suspenders. Select a jersey to wear that has a goalie cut. These jerseys have large arm and shoulder openings and are designed to allow easy movement with all that bulk. Most goaltenders today wear the pro style mask and cage combo like Parker's wearing. Sometimes vision is hindered near the goaltender's feet if the helmet isn't properly sized. Attach the dangler with lacing as Parker has so it moves freely but it won't rise up into your line of sight. The ability of the goaltender to poke check, puck handle, and deflect pucks properly will suffer if the young goalie attempts to use a blocker that's too large. Rising pucks or aggressive opponents may strike the fingers, so look for extra flaps of padded plastic in this area. The trapper is an important piece of equipment and is often improperly fitted. If the glove is too large, the young goaltender may not be able to control rebounds or grasp the shaft of the stick when clearing a loose puck. The best way to break in any piece of equipment is to bend them forcefully in directions they're not supposed to go. You can't hurt the glove. There are some terms that are important to understand when we're talking about goaltender sticks. The blade. The bottom edge of the blade can be rockered or straight. The blade is rockered to assist in puck handling. As well as being rockered, a stick may also be curved to assist in lifting the puck when shooting. The ability to control rebounds may be affected and the backhand shot is almost impossible for the young goaltender if they're using a curved stick. Develop your rebound control and your shot with a straight blade and experiment with a curve a little later. To extend the life of your stick, keep it taped especially the heel. Paddle. The length of the paddle will affect how erect the goaltender will be in their stance. If the paddle is too long, it will force the goaltender's elbow up too high, opening up a large hole underneath the arm and making it very difficult to keep the blade flat on the ice. If the paddle is too short, the goaltender will either be hunched over in their stance or the stick blade will make little if any contact with the ice. The shaft. This portion of the stick should be very smooth and free of tape so that the poke check will not be hindered. As with a forward stick, a good way to check overall length is to place the stick straight up in front of your face and mark the shaft at your chin height. One of the biggest myths that continue to this day is the fact that many believe that goaltenders should use dull skates. Sharp goal skates are crucial in today's game. 
Goaltenders today need to move explosively to get pucks behind the net, to race for loose pucks, to challenge shooters, and to move from one side of the net to the other inside and outside of the crease. Quite simply, this can't be done with dull skates. What do the terms sharpness and hollow actually mean? When a skate is viewed from the front, you can see there are two edges. The inside edge and the outside edge are connected with a concave area known as the hollow. Sharpness refers to how fresh the edge is on the inside and outside edge, and the hollow refers to how deep the concave portion is between the two edges. The deeper this hollow, the more the edges will dig into the ice. A young goalie should get their skates sharpened every five to six ice sessions using a hollow of an inch to three quarters of an inch. A more advanced goaltender can go as deep as three eighths of an inch depending on preferences and abilities. Keeks Keys. Pack your bag in the order you get dressed, placing each piece in order in your bag. This will guarantee you will never forget anything. Learn to use sharper skates to get to the higher levels. Take pride in carrying your own gear and in getting dressed by yourself as soon as possible. Come here, come here, get the heck, come up here, Mortimer, come here, get up here, get up here on TV, come up here, Mortimer, come here, come here, Mortimer, now look at that guy, you want this, do you want a little piece of that, do you want a little piece of that, look at the camera, look at that camera, look at that camera, turn sideways so I can see you in the camera, there you go, look at that camera, look at that camera,